It's a parable. I love the parables. We've been through the explanation of parables. Parables are, <clears throat> quite honestly, not meant to be understood by everybody. <clears throat> it is a device that is used to separate who really gives a rip and who doesn't, quite frankly. A lot of people just come to church. A lot of people hear the word of God out of protocol, out of um, <clears throat> maybe they want to maintain a social status. Maybe they came to church for some other reasons. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. There were a lot of reasons why people followed Jesus. And it wasn't all because I love Jesus. A lot of people just, man, this guy gives food. He gives stuff out. He, he does miracles, sparks fly from his fingertips, all kinds of cool stuff. Let's go see Jesus. And uh, <clears throat> those may be novel reasons to be involved in church <clears throat> or with the body of Christ, but you should really be here because you love Jesus. That's really what it's about. And I want to share something in one of his parables. And as I said, a parable is uh, basically, besides all the other things, it's a veiled message. It can teach an ethical lesson. It can teach about morality. Uh, but it is also a mirror. They hold keys. They're secrets. They're things that have to be unlocked. And quite frankly, people who really just don't have time for that don't care. And I won't say that's fine with Jesus, but he will let you go your own way. If you really don't care and you want to just keep walking on the road to Emmaus and not invite him in to eat, you're welcome to that. But if you will take the time and be courteous and say, I want this stranger to come with me to my house, when he takes the bread and raises it to bless it before God, you're going to see the nail-scarred hands and understand that this is no ordinary event you're involved in. Thank you, J. Mo. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Okay, so one of the parables that Jesus spoke, there are two things going on. Understand this. There is the kingdom of heaven, which I'm going to read from Matthew. And Matthew, by the way, is written to the Jews. Purely. It's not that anybody else can't read it or get it. But Jesus, in the birth of Christ, he has 18 references to this happened that the scripture might be fulfilled. He quotes Isaiah, he quotes Hosea, he quotes Micah, he's going back, he's talking to people who obviously know their Bibles. That's what synagogues were, they were to teach the Jewish people. The Gospel of Matthew has 121 direct references to the Old Testament. This happened because it was written, this happened, that it might be fulfilled, this. So Matthew is clearly written to the Jewish people. It's in a Jewish setting. He talks about things. Go show yourselves to the priest. Offer the sacrifices according to Moses. Non-Jewish people don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to them. Who the heck is Moses? What kind of sacrifice are they talking about? There's all kinds of priesthood and references to things that Jewish people, Jewish cultures understand. So it's a good idea to get a handle on that when you read because listen, and really listen, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, but not all scripture is interpreted by inspiration of God. Okay? A lot of people, you check any cult on planet Earth, and guess where they get their text? They all come out of the Bible. They take Bible verses and they do weird stuff with it. They connect it, they spiritualize it, they put applications in it. So it's even though the word of God is inspired and given, not every interpretation or understanding of the scripture is correct. And even if you're a Christian, I hope you have looked at Bible verses in your life, in your Christian life, and said, oh, I understand that in a different sense now. Because the Bible will interpret the Bible. You'll read things and say, well, I thought, for instance, they came to Jesus and said, who gave you the authority to do these things? You can't, who are you? You can't preach it. You know, where is your authority to go to the temple and preach? And he says, the baptism of John. Let me ask you about that. Where did that come from? 
and you think, boy, that's random. I mean, what's, what's, what's John's baptism have to do with why he has the authority to teach this, to, to teach in the temple? Well, the reason is, is back in Deuteronomy, I don't know, maybe 19 or around there, it is required for the priest to be baptized before he can go into the temple. It's one of the requirements of priesthood. And that's exactly what the Jews in their culture, familiar with the law, were talking about when they came to Jesus. Who gave you the authority to do this? Well, John the Baptist gave him the authority to do that. So I'm going to ask you, the baptism of John, was it of men or was it of God? And if you read the Bible, you know the story that they were backed into a corner. They said, well, if we say John's baptism was of men, we're going to fall out of public favor. Because everybody believed John's baptism was from God. And if we say his baptism was from God, then Jesus is going to nail us and say, well, why didn't you obey it? You know, so what do you, yeah, you know, it's one of those questions. <clears throat> it's the godly version where Jesus asked a rhetoric question and if you answer it, you're nailed one way or the other. I mean, you know, you're manifest one way or the other. Now, the world uses that tactic also in debate, like, you know, have you stopped beating your wife yet and stuff like that. That's how the world would take something like this. <clears throat> but Jesus is simply saying, uh, <clears throat> no, I'm going to ask you a question, and then, oh my gosh, how do you answer it? And then they go back and they say, no man ever spoke like this man. We can't get over on him. We can't, you know, you remember the issue with the taxes. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? I mean, how many people are riled about taxes? Your tax money funds abortions all over the world, does this and does all kinds of stuff that we are vehemently opposed to. And shall we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus' first statement was, why do you tempt me? This is not a real question. This is a trap. You're just setting a trap for me. When they asked him about divorce, guess where that was? That was in the same location where they grabbed John and cut his head off. You know why John went to prison? Because he told the king, he said, you can't have your brother's wife. It, 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 you can't do it, it's against the law. Well, you know, Herod liked what John said, but uh, Herodias didn't like what John said, and you know the story. The daughter danced and asked for, you know, the king said anything up to the half of my kingdom, and she ended up with the head of John the Baptist to take to her mother at her prompting. And <clears throat> so it was kind of, Jesus was asked a lot of very precarious questions. Um, he's used to people wanting to tempt him. But in this, in Matthew, we're in Matthew, and we're going to talk. Matthew, by the way, never, ever, ever, ever says the kingdom of God. You won't find that phrase in the book of Matthew. He's a Jew. Jews have a proclivity against saying God. They, they use different words. They, they're, they're, it's a very strict rule that you do not use the name of the Lord God in vain. And, and as, as a culture, the Jews are afraid to use the word, you read any Jewish publication that has any orthodoxy to it all. It'll have like hyphens where the vowels are and God will be switched around and Yahweh won't be spelled out and things like that. You run into a lot of things where they, they uh -uh, I ain't taking the name of God in vain. And so Matthew never uses kingdom of God. He does say the kingdom of heaven. And I do want to differentiate here that in the kingdoms, this kingdom is ramping up right now, okay? We are in the kingdom of God, which is the rule of God or the spirit of God over the hearts of men. I'm in the kingdom of God right now, okay? But this isn't it. This isn't all that. We're, we're in. We qualify. We've been redeemed. We're part of it. But I want you to know that there is more coming. Jesus Christ is returning to earth again. He's not just coming ethereally in the hearts and minds and memories of men. Jesus is here. No. The physical, actual, tangible body of Jesus Christ is returning back. He is coming back here. And he is going to sit on a physical, political, actual throne in the real city of Jerusalem. 
Yes, the church is the new Jerusalem, and I've read all of Augustine's stuff and his replacement theology, but I'm sorry, he is wrong. There is a real place called Israel, a real place called Jerusalem, a real throne of David, and a real physical Messiah is going to return and sit upon that throne. He's going to rule and reign. He's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron, whether they like it or not. It is a, We are voluntary. We have come in as... We have come in as voluntary servants. We are not just slaves or doulos but we are sons and daughters. Okay, he said, I will pour my spirit out upon your sons and your daughters while I pour out my spirit. Well, what's that mean? He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. I mean, God is not an alien to us. He has actually adopted all of us and made us part of the body of Christ. That's why we know the things of God. Isn't that cool? Like, like, like get this, what Paul wrote in Corinthians, okay? He said, no man's, only the spirit of man knows what is inside of a man. For instance, what color am I thinking of? You don't know. Why don't you know? Because it's inside of me. Now, if God gives you a word of knowledge, that's different. We're not playing that. But how many of you knew that I was thinking of chartreuse? Uh, okay. You, you, you know. No, you didn't know. But check this out. If you were tapped into my spirit and you knew what was inside of me, if you and I shared the same spirit, you would know what's going on inside of me. You would say, yeah, I know what you're thinking because I'm there with you. Okay, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. That's why eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him, but by his spirit. Spirit, He has revealed them. So we can know the mind of Christ. We can know the spiritual things. They're accessible to us. And uh, so let's jump into this parable real briefly here. And I'll uh, try to keep myself on Montana time. Because I, I haven't even touched this text. Matthew chapter 20. Let me read this to you. And this may not be... Um, Shannon, what version is this? Do you know? Okay, all right. All right, this is my daughter's Bible because I really love the Hebrew and the Greek lexicons and all that stuff explained all the way through. Unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know yet, um, I, was born in, I was born again and raised on King James. If you hear me quote Bible verses, they're just King James. That's all that was around in my day. I mean, we didn't have a bunch of translations. So you think, well, where, what, what kind of Bible are you reading, you know? Thus saith the Lord, you know, I, why don't you say the Lord says, or stuff like that. It's just, I'm just old school, that's all. So anyway, this may sound a little strange to some of you, but it's, it's, it's a good translation. In Matthew chapter 20, um, I'm going to begin at verse 1 here. And for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius, which is an amount of money, for the day he sent them into the vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you too, go into the vineyard. And whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. And again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour he went out and he found others standing and said unto them, Why have you been standing here all the day, uh, here idle all the day? And they said unto him, Because no one hired us. He said unto them, You two go into the vineyard. And when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group unto the, uh, to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. And when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. And they also received each one a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the, and the, and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, 
I am doing no wrong. Did you not agree with me or a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. But if I wish to give this last man the same as you, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I'm generous? Thus the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. I'm sorry. <laughs> When I was a kid, we used to have church by the train tracks, and whenever the train went by, you couldn't hear the preaching, so everybody just automatically raised their hands and started praising God. It was a, a wonderful event, so when I hear a train whistle, I'm like, Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. We have our own mentality about justice. This parable is, Hey, that's not fair! I worked all day long and people who hardly put anything in it, they've got almost no skin in the game, they get what I get. What's that all about? It's a sense of justice that we have, but this parable is based upon man's concept of justice. God has his own standards. God has his own method of dealing out justice. But God has a trick. And one of God's tricks is called mercy. And mercy actually rejoices against judgment. Have you ever wondered whatever is going to happen to all the people who never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? God will not be unfair. They will be given exactly what they deserve, period. No more, no less, God is just. That's part of his perfection, part of his character, part of his holiness. He's not influenced by anything or anybody around him. He knows what is right and wrong, and he is just. He'll give out the justice. But the Bible says that mercy rejoices against judgment, and in this parable we see the character of God he doesn't want to pay this one the same as he paid that one, as he paid that one, as he paid that one. Forget it! God, God's desire is to pay mercy. He offers mercy, not justice. He's giving us mercy. Do you want to get paid what you deserve? Do you want to get paid for what you work for? Do you actually really want a just recompense? I don't. Oh, but you've done such great things. You, you know, you travel all around the world and preach to everybody and do all, you know, and have to eat weird stuff and sleep in jungles. And yeah, yeah, surely you want to get paid. No, I don't. I opt for the mercy of God, period. I don't want to hit the scales and be balanced out. Even as a Christian, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I will be judged. You will be judged. Everybody who has ever lived and died is going to be judged. And it's going to be a rather awkward day. But, as I read the book of Revelation, the very last chapter, I have a wonderful relief, surprise at the end. After all that we have done is judged, is balanced out, is evaluated, then he goes to the book of life. And he looks to see if your name is listed in the book of life. And if your name is there, hallelujah, you are in. It doesn't mean that God winked or turned his face from your sin. It just simply means that you and I chose to put the payment of our sin on Calvary. And it was exacted from the person of Jesus Christ. I personally, by the way, believe that all of men's sins were exacted from the sacrifice or the propitiation of Jesus Christ. And I say that because in the word 
tulip, there is an L, which is a standard etiology and theology among certain movements that say that the sacrifice of Christ was limited atonement. I'm sorry, I believe that Christ also died for the unbeliever, the rejecter, the people who are eternally, I hate to use the word, but damned by their choice. And I'll even use a, <laughs> an unbiblical C.S. Lewis quote, hell is locked from the inside. It was never God's design. Hey, you know, do you know what hell was made for? Devil and his angels. It was made for the devil and his angels. It wasn't made for you and me. Right. That, that's not what it's about. That's not God's plan. It's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come unto acknowledgement and repentance and acknowledgement of the truth. Hell is made, cursing, you know, go into hell prepared for the devil and his angels which, by the way, has a lot to do with the length of hell. There are certain annihilation doctrines that are circulating now that say, now nah, you'll only be in hell for a little while. Hell's going to be put out, and everybody is ultimately reconciled to God. Even the, no, no, angels don't die. And so if hell is prepared for the devil and his angels, guess what? It's a permanent fixture. I mean, it's there for good. It's not just there for, you say, well, no, I only live 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. How can I pay eternity in punishment? Well, hell is not rehabilitative. <laughs> I don't really mean to go on this, but I'm on it, so I'll, I'll go ahead and hit it. You know, because our culture has a lot of problems with hell. You say, God is love. He can't send anyone to hell. Well, God is just. He can't let injustice go. Period. If you don't take the mercy of God, do you honestly think that God can just let everybody, adultery, adultery, murder, fornication, theft, covetousness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, you think God can honestly just say, eh, it really doesn't matter? That's not his character. You think for the injustices that have been done against other people, God say, yeah, you know, forget it, it didn't happen to me, that's your problem. No, no, God, there has to be there has to be some kind of balancing out, reconciliation, or payment for injustice. And so, I mean, everybody, this is not a Christian concept. If you're a Greek, if you're a heathen, if you're a whatever you are, I mean, all the religions of the world, good guys and bad guys, everybody gets it. Everybody from every culture, race, perspective, worldview, there's good guys and there's bad guys. We understand that as, as human beings. So, I want to touch on one thing that you say, well, hell is a horrible place. Jesus likened it to a garbage dump. That's what it is. The worm doesn't die, the fire is not quenched, it's just eternal, it's just like dump your trash there. As a matter of fact, that's where the body of Jesus was headed for, for the garbage dump. Because the Romans, after crucifixion, they didn't bury people. They didn't have a Sarah, oh, well, well, we crucified this criminal today, uh, the guy on the right and the left of Jesus. I mean, we're going to, you know, honor the dead. And have, no, there was no honor. There was no respect. If you were crucified, you were humiliated even after death. Your body was thrown in the garbage. They did not have a, a big memorial service for the people that they crucified. Capital punishment doesn't think that highly of people. So... But Jesus was headed until we read that it was Joseph of Arimathea, of Arimathea who of, of course was prophesied back in Isaiah, uh, that he would make his grave with the rich. He came to him and he, be he begged the body of Jesus from Pilate. Pilate said, really? He's dead already? And when Pilate sent word and found out that he was dead, then he gave it. He took it down probably with Nicodemus, it doesn't say, but there's other indications in other Gospels that the two men anointed and wrapped the body of Jesus and they took it to the burial place. Um, we think that Mary and Martha anointed the, bo or anointed the body of Jesus. If you read the scripture carefully, they watched where they put the body because this was a Sabbath. For, for a Jew, that, that's a big deal, okay? The body has to come down, has to be buried. You can't do stuff on the Sabbath. And uh, in the Jewish culture, well, in the Jewish law. So they didn't do anything for the Sabbath. But the next day, early morning, the first day of the week, guess where they were? They were at the grave and they had all that they needed to anoint or perfume the body of Jesus, who they assumed to be there. That was when they found the stone rolled away. And 
we know the story. He's not here, he's risen. Or why seek ye the living among the dead? And Jesus was up and gone by that time. But where was he? Gone from where? Just like, was he in a comatose state? Who was that guy? The guy wrote a book, I think called The Robe. No, no, The Passover Plot. This guy wrote a book, said, no, Jesus just, and he gave all these medical examples of people falling into a comatose state where they've experienced such a trauma. And, you know, he was nailed and speared and all that stuff. They say, no, he was in a comatose state and he revived after. Well, I want you to know that the body that was buried was not the body that was resurrected, okay? It's completely different. We have eyewitness accounts that Jesus appeared in the middle of them. You try doing that in a regular body, okay? You know, they can, they can, I mean, the door was locked. He came in among them. There's a number of instant, inst, instances where he disappeared out of their sight. Okay, well, this is, you know, Henry Houdini couldn't do that kind of stuff. This is a different body. As a matter of fact, when John saw the grave clothes, it said, and then he believed, for he didn't understand the resurrection until he saw the grave clothes. But I'm going to go back to this thing about the parable about we receive mercy, and everything has been given to us by God. Now, I want to share Jesus. Jesus basically, I don't have any other way of saying this, after his death, he went to Sheol, Hebrew, departed. It's the place of the departed. Sometimes we call it hell, and we think that hell is the lake of fire. It's not, I'm sorry. Hell is just the holding pen for unbelievers right now. Later at the end, after the great white throne judgment, there is what's called a lake of fire, which the prophet and the beast who are, who are human beings are thrown into this lake of fire, and the Bible says the smoke of their torment will ascend up forever and ever. And I hope I'm not scaring the little kids, but I hope I am scaring the little kids, you know, because it's just, you know, it's biblical. Whatever God says is, is fine. But I want to read an interesting story because when Jesus resurrected, he came out of hell, okay? Let me go to, uh, let me go to Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 is an interesting because I promise you, you've heard different preaching than what I'm about to tell you. Psalm 22, this is Jesus on the cross, okay? For like several hundreds of years before the crucifixion. Crucifixion was not even invented at this time. And Psalm 22 says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, have you heard that? Does that ring a bell? If, you've re if you're a Bible reader, you'll know that's what Jesus said on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, the standard explanation is that God had turned his face away from Jesus and he couldn't look at him because, and then they go to Peter. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him and God couldn't look on sin. Don't believe me, just think about this. God looks on sin every day. God always sees sin. Nothing is hidden from God. He sees everything. He even sees the sins you're thinking about. I mean, let alone doing. He knows it. So the idea that God can't look on sin, I'm going to have some issues with that because it's not really supported in Scripture. The next question is, does Jesus, is Jesus answering a question, or excuse me, is Jesus asking a question that he really doesn't know the answer to? My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Do, is, it, is it true that Jesus did not know why he was on the cross? He, didn't, he really didn't understand? Like, I'm being crucified and I don't get it. No, I don't find that in Scripture. To the contrary, I find that Jesus knew exactly why he was going to the cross. He told his disciples many times from Matthew 17 on, he starts talking about his crucifixion. I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles, I'll be spit upon, I'll be crucified, and on the third day I will rise again. He told, But his disciples didn't get it, but Jesus got it. I believe Jesus got it. 
In other words, for me to believe that Jesus is on the cross saying, I don't get it. Why am I here? I don't think that's it. Number one, Jesus is quoting Psalm 22. I don't believe Jesus is asking a question he does not know the answer to. I believe he, it's called rhetoric, rhetoric. He is making a statement from the cross. He is making a statement for the people to say, whoa, Psalm 22, my hands and my feet, they're pierced. They cast lots for my vesture. All this is happening and for people to get it and recognize I'm doing this as the Messiah. I am the propitiation for your sins. I think it's a statement that he's making to us from his position on the cross. Well, if you want to get theological about it, you can Google the cry of dereliction. That's what it's called, cry of dereliction. Because when you go through Psalm 22, by the time you hit verse 24, God does not reject the cry of the righteous. To the contrary, God will rescue him. God will save him. So he's not saying if there's sin in your life, God trashes you and he won't look at you and just look at me. And then as certain popular, certain popular religious denominations may teach that Christ went to hell to continue the suffering. It's called Christ. It's called JS. Uh, Jesus died spiritually. JDS. You can Google that too. But Jesus never died spiritually. It is not tenable that God was ever dead. God never died. You say, well, he became sin that the righteousness of God might be found in us. If you examine Peter's verse in his writing. We have English. I'm sorry, guys, but English is not Hebrew. It's not Greek. It's not saying that the person, the Son of God, became sin. It's saying that he became the punishment, the judgment, the chastisement for sin. It doesn't say that the character and the person of Jesus Christ became a wicked, sinful person. He never did. He has always been the Son of God and maintained the integrity that divinity demands of him. Jesus never lost it. When he said on the cross, it is finished, that was in regards to the redemption of you and me. The sacrifice was made. He didn't have to suffer further in hell. The cross, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, the scripture teaches, all the way through Leviticus. The blood was shed. My sins, the penalty of sin, the wages of sin is death. It's paid for. I'm done. Jesus had no more suffering to do. So when he descended, according to Ephesians in the, chap in, the, in, in the fourth chapter, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. This is not theoretical, okay? The actual person of Jesus descended, and this is what's called in here, if you want to do all the theological studies, and you're going to hit a lot of Augustine in this, and be careful about Augustine. He, he's, he's got a lot of stuff that's really screwy, that's real heresy quite honestly, but it's called the harrowing of hell. And when the Son of God descended into hell, or Sheol, not a place of, not the lake of fire, he was seen and witnessed by those people who had died in the faith before. Read Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the very last verse. All these having died in the faith received not the promise, not the promise that they should not be made perfect without us. What that means is that Abraham or Moses or whoever was thousands of years before Christ, and I got saved July 5th, 1968, Abraham looked to Calvary thousands or, you know, 350 or 3,500, you know, B.C. or whatever, and I look backwards 1,900, well, you know, 2,000 years. But Calvary, the shed blood, was the point of Abraham's redemption and the point of my redemption. We were both saved by faith, but on different sides of the cross. It is the, the sacrifice that was made was the eternal sacrifice. Everybody in past, everybody in the future, what they needed, the propitiation they needed was there at Calvary. So now we've got Jesus descending, and like I've said this before to you, there's only one of two ways he can go to hell. 
victorious or in defeat. And if you read Psalm 22, Jesus won on the cross. It was finished. So his entry into the gates, the everlasting gates, was a victorious entry. He was the winner. He is the conqueror. He is the Lord. He is absolute potentate in hell, and hell cannot hold him because it was ordained from God from the beginning that, that the Holy One would never see corruption, which means that his body would not putrefy or rot in the grave, that he would be raised from the dead. And by the way, Jesus did not raise himself from the dead. It was the Father who raised him from the dead. Every reference in Scripture will bear that out. God raised him from the dead. But I want to talk about this coming up, and let me, let me read something here that I think is a very cool story. And uh, it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'm going to start at 9 and read through. Listen to it. You say, well, is the Old Testament relevant? Yes, the Old Testament is relevant. Did you know the early church didn't have the New Testament? If you go to Berean, where they studied the scriptures daily to see if these things were true, what do you think they studied? Did they study Paul's letters to the Corinthians? Did they, you know, no, they didn't exist. So what did they study? They studied the Old Testament. Why? Because the Bible says, Lo, it is written to me in the volume of a book to do thy will, O God. That's how he came. Jesus said, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So every page, every... I told you I had this friend of mine who... who who memorized the New Testament in six months, and he memorized the Bible in a year. And we used to, well, we, he would go to college campuses and preach, and I just kind of tag along, because I was, you know, I was the water boy, gladly, you know, because it was quite a phenomena. And he would start to preach, and he had a regular format. He would start to preach, and then people would heckle him. And then, oh my gosh, Hubert was not one of the people you wanted to heckle because he would chew you up and spit you out. And I mean, instantly, and it's like, oh my gosh, I've never been so humiliated in my life. And then all the people around started laughing at you and you felt like, oh my gosh, find me a rock to crawl under, quick. And he used this tactic to pull a crowd. And he would have on a college campus, he lived with me at the University of Florida in Gainesville, and I'd say within maybe 20 minutes out in the middle of the college campus, he could have, he could have hundreds of students standing around him. They wanted to see if there was going to be a fight. They wanted to see what in the world was going on. But this one Jewish kid, he said, he said, okay, because I'm Jewish and I don't believe in Jesus, I go to hell, is that right? And he simply said, no, because you're Jewish and you don't believe Moses you're going to go to hell. And if you study the scripture, what he meant is Moses spoke of Jesus. Every page in here, every law, every jot and every tittle, every one of the 614 diverse ordinances, everything in the Jewish culture and law is pointing to Jesus. He's, he's, he, he, it's him. Lo, I've come in the volume of a book. So, yes, I'm going to read you a story of King David, and, uh, and then I'll tie it here to the New Testament. Okay, this is it. Let me, let me give you a setting here. David is in a city called Ziklag. David's a king. He didn't choose to be king, but he just loved God, and God made him king. Uh, he had older brothers who were more educated, who were bigger, who were stronger, better looking, better, you know, I don't know, politicians, financiers, whatever you want to call it. They, according to their abilities, they had a lot more talent than David had. But God chose David. That's it. It was just a matter of election. God said, I want him to be king. And I'm not saying David didn't have anything to do with that. Uh, he was a shepherd. And you say, well, boy, that's not much of a preparation for being a servant of God, being a shepherd. Well, if a bear and a lion come in to kill your sheep and you are so you are so defensive or you are such a caretaker of your sheep that you're willing to kill a bear with your bare hands or kill a lion with your bare hands, I'd say you're probably pretty excited. You might be the man for the job then, okay? If, if, these, if, these, if these sheep mean that much to you and you're willing to risk yourself to that extent to protect sheep, yeah, you, you, might, you might protect my people too, you know? Now, 
I'm not saying that God chooses us because of our qualities. Please don't misunderstand that. But David was chosen above his brethren. And he had a city called Ziklag, where he kept his family, he kept his belongings, he kept all his stuff. It was, it was home. It was home to him. Well, Ziklag was raided by the Amalekites. And today that's totally politically incorrect. You can't take anything away from anybody, but in the history of the real world, it's called right of conquest. And it happened all the time. And it, it, it goes on today. And just today we say it's not fair, it's not just. But, you, you know, uh, <laughs> every one of you, if you dig far enough in your background, you're going to find that somebody, I mean, you build a little fence around your lot, around your house. Who told you you could have that? I mean, where did that come from? Well, I got the laws of the United States of America that says this is my property. Okay, well, where did those laws come from? And if you keep going back farther enough, you're going to run into the stories like Attila the Hun coming out of Mongolia, chasing the Germanic tribes all over uh, Western civilization at that time, and people going into England and the Germans and, and the Normans and the Franks in France and the Visigoths and Ostagoths. And if you know, you know, Western Civ, these names will mean something to you, you know. These are people that were displaced. Why? Because Attila the Hun <laughs> was no, he was somebody nobody wanted to fool with him. He was really a nasty man. But he didn't come in to buy land. He didn't come in to make deals that, hey, listen, if you elect me. No, it was like, I'm here, this is mine. You say it was yours, it's mine now. And that was it. It's called right of conquest. And history is absolutely full of it. I, I mean, it's inescapable. So you've got David and Ziklag. He's got the city, he owns it. And the Amalekites come in and they say, ha, we want the city. We're going to take it. We're going to burn it. We're going to take everything out. And uh, so they did that. David was out of town. He was on a business trip at that day. And he comes back and... His wives, I'm sorry, we won't explain polygamy, but his wives were gone, and his children were gone, and his money and his, and his sheep and ass and, and, you know, cattle. I mean, everything he had was gone, you know? And then the people said, David, I feel like stoning you. <laughs> and because he's in charge, right? So it's like... When, 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 when the politician can't get it right, it's like all the people are saying, David, I feel like stoning you. you. You should really be stoned for your negligence. And David was very discouraged. He wasn't afraid of the people, but he got in this place called the Hold, which was a place where David met with God. And he said, God, what am I going to do? I mean, these people, my people want to kill me. What, what, what do I do? And God said, go get them. Go out and get the Amalekites and bring your stuff back. That's And I'll go with you if you do that. So this is the story here that David is saying, okay, prayer time is over. I'm feeling this one. Let's go redeem. Let's go get back what the enemy has stolen from us. Let's go redeem something. So David went, he and his 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook Basor, where those left behind remained. Okay, there were some men in David's army that traveled to the brook, and David said, let's cross the brook and go, and they said, I'm too old. I can't make this trip. I'm too tired. I'm worn out. I'm exhausted. Well, they stayed behind. They just stayed behind. That's it. So, but David pursued. David went and he and 400 men, so he's missing. 200 are staying back, and 400 are taking off. For 200 who were too exhausted to cross the brook remained behind. Now, they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread, and he ate, and they provided him water to drink, and they gave him a piece of fig cake and two clusters of raisins, and he ate. Then his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, to whom do you belong? And where are you from? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, a servant of the Amalekites. And my master left me behind when I fell sick three days ago. Right. We made a raid 
on the Negev of the Cherethites and on that which belongs to Judah and on the Negev of Caleb and we burn Ziklag with fire. Okay, so this guy, he's a good catch. <laughs> he's a good catch. He knows because David is looking for the culprits here. Then David said to him, will you bring me down to this band? And he said, well, swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring you down to this band. And when he had brought them down, behold, they were spread all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of the great spoil that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. So they got the goods, and they are partying. They're celebrating. Woohoo! look what I got. And David slaughtered them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Which isn't one day. Don't forget, it, for a Jew, the, the evening and the morning were the next day. Okay, that, that's, their days are different than ours. And not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives. But nothing of theirs was missing neither small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that they had for themselves, David brought it all back. David had captured all the sheep and the cattle which the people drove ahead of the other livestock, and they said, this is David's spoil. Okay, here we go. When David came to the 200 men who were too exhausted to follow David, who had also been left at the brook Basor, and they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. Then David approached the people and greeted them. Then all the wicked, all the wicked and, and worthless men among those who went with David answered and said, what wicked and worthless men went with David? These guys were great fighters, great doers, but they had a bad heart. Here's what they said. Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. In other words, this guy doesn't deserve a whole day's wage. This guy doesn't deserve, he was hired at the last hour, why, sh why should he get anything? We have the infusion of man's concept of justice here. They didn't fight with us. They stayed behind. So what should they get? Nothing. They should know. We're the ones that did all the work. We're the ones that should be paid. Then David said, you must not do so, my brethren, with what the Lord has given us, who has kept us and delivered us and delivered into our hand the band that came against us. And we will listen to you in this, and who will listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down to the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And so it has been from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel to this day. You say, well, what does that have to do with the New Testament? One of my favorite psalms is 68. And I'm going to read to you something that was quoted about Jesus coming out of hell at his resurrection. In Psalm 68, verse, I think it's 18. Yeah. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captives. Thy captives. Thou hast received gifts among men. Even among the rebellious also that the Lord God may dwell there. Ephesians quotes it a little bit differently. It's a different language. It says that when he ascended, he brought captivity captive. All right, think of David. He caught all the, he brought, this is a redemption story. As Jesus went to Sheol and redeemed those who were waiting, he brought them out of the enemy's territory. He redeemed them and brought them back. And he did more than that. When he ascended, Jesus had gifts. He had very special gifts. Just like David, who was in front, had very special gifts. Jesus had received very special gifts at the resurrection, at the redemption of the captives, at the resurrection of the dead. 
he had received very special gifts. When he ascended, I'm talking about the physical person Jesus, went up into the clouds, and that's a Nephilim, not a Nephilim, which is a whole different story, but he went up into a cloud of glory, and as he ascended, he gave his gifts to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, government helps, diversities of gifts. Jesus had very precious gifts that he gave us when he ascended up. Therefore, our strengthening, our edification, and you can read this through Hebrews, that these are offices, not just there are gifts of the Spirit, but these are offices, these are positions, jobs, functions within the body of Christ that are not the will of man. Quite honestly, we never earned them. We did nothing to gain them. Our effort to lay claim on them is pitiful and pathetic. Who are we? Jacob is a worm, trust me. We are nobody. Well, absolutely have no right to claim. I'm just someone that stayed by the stuff, someone that sat by the baggage. I didn't go to hell, I didn't fight, I didn't win, I wasn't righteous, I wasn't, I, I wasn't anything. I totally am not somebody qualified to receive this gift. But David said, no, they get it. And when Jesus ascended, he said, no, they get it. It's mine, I gained it, I earned it, I went to hell, I conquered, I fought, I paid, I bled, I died, I deserve, I have the gifts given to me, but I'm going to give them to you. Even though I put in all the blood, sweat, and tears, I'm going to share what I have gained with you.